Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about science. On January 20th, 1901, it was reported, a few days ago a startling announcement was made to the effect that Professor A.E. Douglas of the Flagstaff Observatory in Arizona had received a message from Mars. And even more startling is that Nikola Tesla, whom Tesla Cars is named after, was actually talking to the Martians. And by 1907, the New York Times had determined that Martians were probably superior to humans. By 1909, the New York Times and our leading scientists had pretty much figured out why the Martians had built their canals. The Martians built their canals for drainage, to prevent floods when the polar ice caps melted. In 1911, the New York Times had determined that Martians had built two immense canals in just two years. Vast engineering works accomplished in an incredibly short time by our planetary neighbors. By 1915, astronomers had quite generally accepted the theory that the canals are the product of an intelligent action, artificial aids to agriculture, irrigation projects on a scale impossible on the Earth's surface. Wow, those Martians must be amazing people, or at least amazing Martians. In 1919, it was reported, the fact that the Martian canals exist is no longer doubted even by the most religious astronomer. No one doubts today that these canals are parts of an enormous irrigation system which supplies water to the desert inlands. The scientists' knowledge kept growing. By 1920, scientists agreed that Martians were a super race and believed that they were signaling to us. Professor Lowell held that Martians were far advanced in inventions and science. But by 1921, there was some bad news for Martians. There's life on Mars. It's probably waging a fierce battle for continued existence by every artificial means known to a highly developed, super-intelligent civilization fighting against extinction from rapidly dwindling air and moisture. So by 1921, global warming was destroying Mars. That probably explains why so many Extinction Rebellion protesters have green hair. By 1926, infrared photography showed that the dark areas on Mars could only be explained by vegetation. In 1927, the New York Times reported that one of the last Mars deniers had become a true believer in life on Mars. By 1928, belief that Mars was constantly signaling to the Earth was gaining ground among scientists. In 1940, experts took 8,000 photographs of a new Martian oasis. If they had 8,000 pictures of it, then it's got to be true. Soviet scientists confirmed in 1948 that plant life exists on the planet Mars without any doubt. In 1950, the New York Times said, Most astronomers now concede that the dark color that comes and goes seasonally on Mars is evidence of some low form of vegetation. Dr. Tombaugh was a very famous scientist. He was the astronomer who discovered Pluto. We certainly couldn't question his judgment. And in 1965, a noted astronomer from Berkeley had found evidence of canals and oases in seven of the 22 pictures taken of Mars by the Mariner 4 spacecraft. And they released very detailed drawings of the Martian canal network. If spacecraft saw the canals, then they've got to be real. And in 1996, NASA once again says that life used to exist on Mars. They didn't actually have any evidence of life on Mars, but it brought in a lot of funding and publicity for them. And two years later, they were still sticking to their claims, even though there still wasn't any evidence. They claimed that they had found fossilized remains of tiny bacteria-like animals in meteorites which came from Mars. That's a far cry from the very advanced civilization which the New York Times was talking about in 1920. And the reality was that they were just seeing some amorphous structures in the rock which had nothing to do with life. That wasn't the last time NASA tried the Life on Mars scam. They've tried it a couple more times since then. But the hard truth about Mars was published in the New York Post four years ago. Martians were wiped out by global warming, most likely because they failed to enact the Green New Deal. The great author and climate skeptic Michael Crichton explained why this sort of nonsense goes on in the scientific community. I want to pause here and talk about this notion of consensus and the rise of what has been called consensus science. I regard consensus science as an extremely pernicious development that ought to be stopped cold in its tracks. Historically, the claim of consensus has been the first refuge of scoundrels. It's a way to avoid debate by claiming that the matter is already settled. Whenever you hear the consensus of scientists agrees on something or other, reach for your wallet, because you're being had.
The lesson from all this is that once scientists start down the wrong path, groupthink and peer pressure continues to drive the science towards total nonsense. This is exactly what we've seen with the global warming clown show. Climate alarmists live in an echo chamber and have no clue what's going on in the real world. But it doesn't make any difference to them. They get funding, prestige, acknowledgement, and publicity. For many academics, those factors are far more important than facts and science. That's where Toto comes in. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time. You can visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com.